we should be live. Hey everyone, I'm, uh, it's time for Open Space, uh, your Monday live question show with me and sometimes a guest. Uh, we didn't have guests for the last three weeks, but now we're back to having a guest and actually we've got a bunch of guests for the next at least four or five weeks. So, so buckle up. Uh, this week, I'm joined by uh, Dustin Gibson from Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Dustin, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me, man. This is fun stuff. It's only fair uh, to have you join me um, since, uh, you know, I've been a twice guest on yeah. your show now. And so, uh, yeah, I figure. Yeah, we, we bring you on for all the hard ones, too. You know, the, talking about conspiracy theories, all the things I know you hate talking about. Yeah. So I'm all really excited to to offer that up for you. That's, you're too kind. And then, of course, <laughs> the uh, the other thing, which we're definitely going to get into, is you are, you know, with OPT, building out this network of observatories around the world. And this is what we've been using for the virtual star parties that we were doing uh, last year. And we're glad to uh, announce that the, the telescopes are back online and we've doing a bunch of new tests and we should be going, uh, bringing these back within days. So I hope people are, are stoked to, uh, work with, uh, work with live telescopes again. Yeah. I'm excited to talk about it, man. It's been a fun project and you've been there since the beginning of it with us. So yeah, testing a lot is an understatement, but <laughs> Hey, we're there. We're there yeah. and we made it. We made it. So, um, yeah, we're, we're just about to, uh, to turn the corner and start having this public again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so f so for anyone who doesn't know, who are you and uh, what do you do? Yeah, so I'm here with OPT. Uh, uh, Jenny and I bought the company about uh, three years ago now. And uh, yeah, three years ago as of September. Wow, it's gone fast. Um, it's just a blur. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, didn't start in telescopes, got my start in fitness. But, um, you know, like a lot of people, you know, looking at the room behind you, yourself included, you buy a dob on craigslist or whatever happens that's my story and you get hooked you know it becomes an addiction and so it was it went from being something that i had a casual interest in to something i literally do every night that's clear yeah and i'm imaging all the time to the point now where you and i are you know spending all of our free time building an <laughs> observatory network around the world right so so but i mean like specifically you were you were running like you're running some different business right you're like you say you're in the yeah. fitness industry like what were you doing right yeah it was completely unrelated so um it was basically we were doing analysis for professional athletes and then doing endocrine programming so it was um it's a lot of you know, boring talk, but basically what would happen was we, we kind of abandoned the caloric model of, you know, you give certain people this many macros and these calories, you give two people the same thing, they're going to get different results. So we developed this new model and kind of we're working with just a handful of people and really testing it and it just, it worked. So we were doing it based on the endocrine system instead. And we were very fortunate, you know, it took off and we, we had a really good ride with it. But at the end of the day, it wasn't really fulfilling for myself or my business partner, Jenny. Um, there's only so long you want to look at a guy's abs right. before you're just like, I don't care anymore. Right. I don't care. And that was me. So we wanted to move to something that we cared about and that ended up being astronomy. So, but then like, how did that getting into astronomy how did that happen? When did you sort of, when did this moment hit you that it was that you wanted to try, uh, you know, getting a telescope and doing some observing? So it's kind of funny because I feel like I'm the only person that doesn't have that story that's like, um, you know, I loved it since I was a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut. I was always looking at space, all these things. I really didn't have much of an interest. Honestly, I think the first telescope I bought, I bought on Craigslist as a gift for my business partner. Because she's a painter. Right. And, and so I didn't even know what it was. It was a Dobsonian. They don't look like telescopes to, some, to the untrained eye, right? And so even she, when I unveiled it to her, she's like, did you buy me a cannon? <laughs> like, what is this thing, you know? And so we took it outside and we were going to try to look at the moon with it. That's the only thing we knew how to do. And literally, we were, I mean, we didn't even know how to focus. So you see these knobs. Fortunately, it was the only knobs on the thing. So we pointed it at the light. It was super bright. And so I didn't know. I was like, is it so magnified that I'm just looking inside one crater? Like, what's happening? But then twisted the little knob and then it pops into focus. And everybody in this, this hobby has that moment yeah. where you see it for the first time. And looking at the moon through a big Dobsonian, 
I mean, it's like you're flying over in an airplane. That's what it looks like, <laughs> you know, like being over the earth in an airplane looking down. That's what it looks like with you on the moon. And I could not believe what I was seeing and neither could she. And you must and, have had that experience now where you show people like Saturn in a telescope oh, and they can't believe that they're looking at, that they're actually looking at Saturn. Everybody thinks it's fake. It's, it's fake, yeah, you, yeah. There's some kind of picture. They, look, they check the front to see if <laughs> exactly. you're somehow putting like a picture in front of yeah. it. But, but it really is this, just this almost spiritual moment for people that when they see, say, Saturn or the moon at that kind of a right. resolution, for the first time, it is, it's, you know, you're, e you're either completely hooked or you're dead inside. Yeah, if astronomy is an addiction, right, then then definitely Saturn, the moon and Jupiter, that's the gateway drugs. Yeah, that's the worst analogy in the world. I know, but I it's know, true, though, because I mean, it does it gets in your in your blood, you know, and, and I think that that I mean, like that, I mean, that experience was the same for me, I was but I was a little little younger and I grew up in, I think, better access to dark skies and had more of, of a astronomy influence from my family. We went out and looked at meteor showers and watched lunar eclipses and, and things like that. But but still, it was there was when I got my telescope for the first time. But for me, I bought a telescope and hadn't looked through a telescope yet. And, right. You know, so, so kind of the same same situation. But for a lot of people, they look through a telescope and they're like, OK, I need one. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you see it, you can't unsee. You can't go back to that moment before you had seen that. It's a perspective shift, you know, and it's something that for me, I mean, my original time through school was for philosophy. And I feel like I learned more in 15 seconds through a telescope than I did in four years, you know, scrambling, going through every page I could trying to find answers on the next page. But it just gives you this perspective that nothing else in the world can, at least to my knowledge, because it's only when you look that far outside of yourself that you really can kind of get an understanding of exactly who you are, where you are, you know, what our place is, all of those things. And it's the, it's the most unifying experience for people. But it's also something that's very personal, it's deeply personal. And even for those that are non-religious like myself, it can be a very, as you called it, a spiritual yeah. experience. And I think that's why people get so hooked. It's certainly why I did. And and so then, I mean, you know, you had that moment. Um, and then how did that, you know, how, where did the rabbit hole go? Uh, well, when we moved to California, it was um, it was just I was trying to get into astrophotography. And as you know, uh, when you don't have the observatories that are fully automated and doing everything for you, astrophotography is very challenging. Yes, it's challenging from even from just equipment acquisition, trying to figure out with whatever it is you're trying to do, what should I buy? You know, and that's that's why OPT has been here for 73 years, you know. And so what happens is like I I was trying to get into it and I didn't know what to do. And so I just started Googling like how what do I need? How do, how do I take this next step? And everything kept leading me to me, leading me to this company in California. And so I started calling and I, I got close with one of the salespeople. And he, as a joke, just told me one day, he's like, you know, you really ought to just come out here and work for us. We have a, an entry level sales position open. You ought to do it. And so I flew out the next day without even telling him and just <laughs> just to come out kind of as a joke. I was like, I'm going to go check this thing out because I really want to see the place anyway. Yeah, you at least wanted to just yeah. go to the telescope capital of the universe and bathe exactly. in their glow. Exactly. That's what he was telling. He's like, look, there are more telescopes in this building than anywhere in the world. Right. Come check it out. So I flew out and uh, I came, I met with them and I called Jenny and I was like, you know, I think I think we should move out here and just do this. And she's like, you want to move out there and work as an entry level salesperson at OPT? And I was like, absolutely. Like, I really think this would be a good experience. And we're kind of at this place where we don't know what we want to do, but we know it's not what we're doing. Yeah. And so let's bet on ourselves that this is something that's meaningful and that this passion is worth pursuing. And she agreed. I mean, it honestly, like that was it. It took no pushing because she's, she's the same kind of way. She's like, let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's really, let's, look, let's roll the dice on this passion for astronomy. And so the idea was just to be around the people that knew and that were already living out that passion and that dream. And there's no collection of people in the world like there is inside this building. And so we worked there for a year before we ever talked about buying the company. We actually had no interest in buying the company. Zero. Uh, 
what did you think it might have turned into? Like, were you were you guys going to maybe set up a competitor? Were you going to like like you were, or was this going to maintain no. as a hobby? It wasn't a business move. It was it was just about the passion project. It was just about coming out. I had this idea that I wanted to become better at imaging. I wanted to be the best imager I possibly could and explore more of space than I ever imagined. That was it. Like there was no, well, we're going to go out there and then we're going to find this business model and we're going to make all this money. We're going to do it. Like it was none of that at all. It was just, let's go get good at imaging and let's literally work five feet from the experts. We can yeah. ask anything we want all day. And we did. <laughs> they got tired. Yeah. They got tired of us being there because it was just nonstop. And it still is. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. But um, but now but now everybody has to has to answer your questions because they work for you, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean I still work for them. I still work for them. But it's definitely you know that's the benefit of being here is that this place is full of people that have the same mindset. You know, if it's clear you want to find OPT employees, go to a dark sky. They're there. You know, that's where they're they're with their telescopes, they're imaging, they're doing visual, they're doing whatever, but it's astronomy related or yeah. running the observatories. Yeah. Um, so for a bunch of people are just to give people a bit of a perspective, I want to just show some people some of your pictures, sure. which I've got uh, sort of set up here. Hopefully this will work. And then um, uh, and I'm going to share your the screen at you so you can then OK, you can then sure. see. So this is so we're looking at your Instagram profile. And right. I apologize to everybody who is listening to this as a podcast, but I want to just give people some examples of the work that you're doing and just the kind of, of time and energy that is, that is going into this. And I think, you know, the one that I love that's fairly recent is your, um, is your Lagoon Nebula. So I believe that's the Lagoon, yeah. right? That is the Lagoon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, never so, been. so a picture like this, which mm -hmm. is again for the people listening to this as a podcast like i don't know what to tell you go to gibson picks on instagram and you can take a look at his pictures what goes into a photograph like this so i've shot this one a few times i believe this one was with the rasa which you're very familiar with mm -hmm. it's what we use in the observatory so it's an f2 system super fast i mean it's camera lens fast and so myself and then a photographer out here have become close with travis burke set this up in the parking lot and, um, you know, we're doing one minute exposures and just cranking them out and combining them. And I believe that's this shot. I've, I've shot it twice. So I, I think this is the one that I did that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, there's an idea. This, it's what always happens. Like there's an idea for a shot. And then we put the equipment together to go get that shot. And um, sometimes they're very easy where you can do it in a single night like this one. And then other ones that are on there, you know, are 90 yeah. hours. Yeah, of let's go for the 90 hours. See if I can find it here. Um, the Helix. The Helix, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not this one, is it? No, that's the dumbbell. Okay, there we go. This one. There it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's ninety hours. So night after night after night for weeks, you know, just imaging the same thing, trying to get the noise down and really be able to blow it up on a huge system. You know, that's a big seventeen-inch plane wave, but that's how you can see the super faint galaxies, like there in the bottom right. You know, that stuff is just so far out there. But you know, you put in the time every single night. And that's the beautiful thing about the observatories is, you know, that automation allows you to go back to the exact same spot night after night and get full nights of imaging on a single target. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's the, you know, for a lot of people, all right, let's see if we can bring us back here. Um, it's very, let's see. Uh, yeah, for a lot of people, that being able to set aside, say, 90 hours of of observing on one picture right. uh, is is pretty crazy because again, they, obviously, you know, there, there are no nights that are ninety hours long. So, so how many separate exposures might go into a uh, into a into a picture like that? So for us, we're doing a lot of different types of imaging all the time. My personal imaging is always narrowband. I, I prefer narrowband imaging because it cuts through all the light pollution. I like to share it with people. For me, it's all about sharing. Right. So I shoot from a lot of cities. I mean, I shot from Times Square this past year, you know, New York. And to do that, you have to have these filters that are so narrow, they can cut out all that light pollution. I mean, we're talking three nanometers narrow. And um, so I use these filters, combine them to get a color image like what you just saw. 
But because they're so narrow, they're blocking out, you know, 99% of the light. So I have to do these exposures that are like 45 minutes to an hour to get that kind of detail in there you know, 45 minutes at a time, there's a lot that can go wrong in 45 minutes, you know, a meteor goes through or a satellite or a plane or the wind blows or anything can go wrong. You know, out here, we even have these little uh, tremors, right? Yeah. Like whatever it is, it shakes a little bit, but then that exposure is gone. So it's just one hour after the next. And then at the end of it, you have 90 of them and you combine all of that data. So these are huge files huge but you get all of this data and it it just produces a clean image that you can do a lot with yeah so so obviously then you know for people who love this hobby from afar mm -hmm. um really love the pictures they want to get involved right what is the best way today do you think for a person to to get involved in a in in astrophotography as a hobby Honestly, you know, the my co-host for the Space Junk podcast, Tony, he always says, you know, this is the golden age for astronomy. And it really is. But it's really the golden age for amateur astronomy, because all of the technology that's been happening in other industries like like Sony going all in on their uh, mirrorless cameras has had a real benefit to astronomy because all of a sudden the sensor prices have come down so much with these CMOS sensors that have gotten so good that before would have what would have cost you eight or nine or ten thousand plus dollars to get into people are doing now for eight hundred bucks a thousand dollars and getting the same type of quality and that's a that's a really big I mean that's a drastic swing for people it opens the door to everybody and so you is know, that the you... big thing then that's the big change I mean I guess glass is glass and and yeah, mounts well, are mounts but to have these cameras come down in price so sensitive and so quickly that's been the big game changer cameras have definitely been a big uh, game changer filter uh, the filters have as well like we we released the triad filter last year and that allows you know it basically eliminates the light pollution problem it's a multi-band filter where you can shoot like i was talking about narrow band from anywhere so when we're shooting from Times square with one filter in color you know, if if you're if Times Square isn't too bright, your backyard definitely is not too bright. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so being able to do that, it eliminates the problem, you know, that you have to drive three hours out into a desert somewhere or you have to pack up because a lot of times people do that and then it clouds over anyway. Yeah. And you lose a lot of nights and people just don't want the hassle of it. So chipping away at these problems and it's all happening at the same time. The mounts are getting better. The telescopes are phenomenal. I mean, you can do so much like that telescope behind you at 70 millimeter. People are taking NASA APOD level images mm -hmm. with scopes that size. It's not something where you need something the size of, you know, a school bus anymore. You can do it with that tiny thing, the size of a can of tennis balls. Yeah. And so all of that happening at the same time in the same direction is just making possible today. What wasn't yesterday. And it's cheaper now than it's ever been. So let's say that a person does want to get into the hobby. Um, what is your recommendation for, for where to start? There, you know, it really comes down. So, and that's, that's what our team here does so well, but when people call, cause we get the question, you know, a hundred times a day, Yes, you know, the phone never stops ringing. Yeah, I get it too. What's so the, please, what's let's the give best you... thing to buy. Yeah. And the truth is there are a lot of questions that go into that. Like, what are you trying to shoot? Because if it's, if it's Saturn, that's important to you, then, you know, that 70 millimeter behind you isn't going to be the yeah. right telescope. But generally what we tell people is that you, should, you shouldn't just go all in on the most advanced and complex equipment out there. That is not the answer. And usually it can have the same effect as people going in on products that are above that frustration curve where you buy, you know, the 50 or $60 telescope from Walmart and then you get it home just in time to put it in the closet and never touch it again because it's frustrating to even look at it. You know, it's impossible to use. And so like there's kind of this sweet spot. Most people get into it for around three to four hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars is like a pretty nice system. Um, but it doesn't take a lot, especially for visual astronomy. It really doesn't. I mean, you no. can get a phenomenal Dobsonian for three hundred, four hundred dollars where you're looking at other galaxies. I mean, you see an Andromeda with stuff like that. So but but we you. were I mean I I'm I'm a gigantic fan of the Dobsonian and and if sure. a person wants a telescope and wants to visually observe the sky I am 100% yeah. in agreement that the 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 Dobsonian well, you know get a nice pair of binoculars is yeah. a great start yeah. but they're cheap right 50 bucks for a pair of astronomical binoculars and you're and you're good to go and that Dobsonian is great too like to but but the 
the secret or the dirty little secret in this whole thing is that you've only got three things to look at. Yep. If you get a Dobsonian telescope, you've got the moon, you've got Saturn, you've got Jupiter. Now, if you go to a place that gives you some marginally dark skies, then you've got some star clusters you can look at, some globulars look great, some planetary nebula look great, but you're really going to tap out the galaxies, the, the other nebulae, things like that. They're just yeah. gray smears in yeah. your field of view. And, and it's <laughs> not that picture of the Helix it's Nebula, true. right? It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely true. And so, so astrophotography is the unlock. Like that's the one that yeah. does start showing you the universe, the way Star Trek has told you it's supposed to look. Well, it's, it's no secret. I'm, I'm an imaging guy. You know, I talk about it all the time on the podcast, but it, the reason I still talk about visual as something that's extremely important are those three things that you mentioned. So Saturn, the moon and Jupiter, those three are worth that experience are worth going in on because yeah. that, I mean, that's what hooks people. It's what hooked me. Everyone I know, they say one of those three, usually Saturn, honestly, they say, I saw Saturn. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought it was fake. And now it is forever in my blood, right? Astronomy is forever in my blood. But I agree with you. I think that if you want this to be something that the masses can appreciate, it has to be photography. It has to be the imagery that you can produce. And getting these nebulae and galaxies in color to people, that's what makes it real. That's what makes it, you know, where people can experience like what we do with virtual star parties, where you've got all of these people, thousands of people that can watch as the telescope moves. So they know this isn't just another NASA image we're pulling offline yeah. or something like that, but they watch it come in live. That's the thing that I think makes it connects all of this to this is my neighborhood. It's not just a photo of something that doesn't mean anything to me. This is a place in space that is possible to even go like this is something that's there and it's there all the time. And I can take a picture of my neighborhood around me now where that wasn't possible for any generation in human history other than the ones living today. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing thought. So, I mean, for me, I kind of break it down to three distinct groups. If I was to sort of think about astro imaging, there's sort of three, three paths you can take to specialize in. One is the planetary stuff. And they're the people who, who do see the Saturn and the moon and the Jupiter, and then they just want to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And yeah. you can get really specialized gear, like, like Damien Peach operating out of, uh, he's got a remote observatory out of um, uh, Chile and his images of Mars, right? Right, right? You would think you're looking at the Hubble Space Telescope. Like True. they are so good. And so right. you can absolutely just keep going that pathway after planetary stuff. And that's one setup. And then you end the moon and all of that, right? Bright objects, short exposures, long video. Right. There's other people that go for the wide field stuff. And that is almost the most accessible, I think. And then there's the deep sky, sure fainter objects, narrow band filtering. And that's the, that's, that's the rabbit hole that never ends. Yeah. Yeah. When you really start trying to get the magnification to go after these targets in that way, I mean, 3000, 4000 millimeters of focal length on a galaxy, you get a lot of challenges there. I mean, think about even just the atmosphere. That's like looking down a hot desert road and seeing those heat waves and then magnet or uh, magnifying them to where it's the only thing you see are those heat waves, yeah. you know, and then trying to take a picture of something behind it. It's very, very, very challenging. But like you said, wide field is the most accessible. It's what most people are doing. And the benefit of these new cameras, you know, 40, 50, 60 megapixel cameras is you can shoot wide and then not have all the issues with tracking and guiding because it doesn't, it's not as critical when you're at those focal lengths and then crop into the image because you've got the resolution now that didn't exist, you know, five years ago. And so that's, that's another one of those things where it is accessible. People are doing it all the time for, you know, a fraction of the cost that it used to be. And the equipment's making, you know, making it fairly simple to do. It's kind of like wide field deep space is almost as easy now as what, you know, Milky Way photography yep. was for people five years ago. So can you explain that in a little more detail, what, what like a wide field deep space is? Sure, sure. So when we say wide field, it, <clears throat> it probably really should start with Milky Way photography because that's, you know, that's the most popular thing on social media. It's what most people see. And that's where you see the big streak across the sky. It's always it's beautiful. It, every single time. And when you see it in person, it absolutely knocks you down. It's so amazing. But that's, um, you know, capturing the whole core of the Milky Way 
with an exposure. And because you're so wide, you're, you're looking at so such a huge chunk of sky, there's not much movement in a short period of time. So in 20, 30 seconds, you don't see the stars really streak. But the more magnification you add, the more you're going to see that streak across the same amount of time. And so as you zoom in, so like when you start, if you can see the whole Milky Way, you know, at least the whole core of the Milky Way, then you, you know, you can see maybe like right there, there's Rho um, or the Lagoon Nebula in the center or on the left side of the image. If you just want to take a picture of the Lagoon Nebula, which we just sh uh, showed, you know, we shot it in narrow band, so the colors were reversed. But if you just want to magnify just enough to get into that, it's still not that much magnification and you can do it with, you know, very modest equipment. And so it's still wide field, like the Milky Way would be considered very wide field. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's not so magnified like these galaxies that I'm shooting there. That's that's where we're at 3000 millimeters of focal length, where if anything goes wrong, that image is destroyed. You know, that's much, much more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's like think about Andromeda. That's a good wide field target because it's so mm -hmm. big. You can't really see it from most places in the world. You have to be in a really dark sky. But Andromeda is a huge chunk of sky. I mean, it's six full moons wide in the sky. So you have to really have a pretty wide field of view to be able to capture the whole thing. And you I know. think that you can reuse a lot of your gear. Um, right. If, if you've got like a modern DSLR camera that you're bird watching, that you're uh, shooting family photos, whatever you need to do. And then you can, if you have like a nice tracking mount and they're not that expensive, a couple of hundred dollars to right. get into that, then, then you're, then, you know, you, you overcome this problem of the sky of the earth turning and your star is trailing, you get these, these images that are, that are long exposures and then you can stack them up and then you can start to produce these images. And that's, I mean, if you've already got a camera, and you can get even those used fairly inexpensively, then you're only in for a couple of hundred dollars and starting to go down that, down that rabbit hole. And the, and the lenses that you use are just as good. You know, if you've got a zoom lens with a long exposure, it's of use both as a regular lens, but also for astrophotography. I mean, obviously you can hyper specialize, but it's a, it's a great right. way to start. It's, yeah, it's a perfect way. And it's where most people do start because you've already got it. It's got the focal length and you're going to give up something in the way of, you know, the corners of the image. And, you know, obviously like telescopes are designed for the specific purpose and they perform much, much better than a camera lens can with 18 or 19 elements or, or whichever camera lens it is. But, um, you know, as far as just getting the job done and being able to see these things, absolutely. It'll perform and um, it gets people started in a, in a real way. And yeah, it doesn't take much with a tracking mount. A couple hundred bucks and you're in. Now, I mean, in addition to running OPT, which keeps you right. pretty busy, um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. selling telescopes to to various scientific organizations and governments and enthusiastic right. amateurs, um, you've got a bunch of other projects that you're that you're working on, and I wanted to just talk about some of these. So let's just talk about the telescopes first, and then move on to some of the other interesting projects that you have you have in the works. Sure. Sure. So the uh, the telescope, I mean, you're talking about the the observatory. Project. Yeah, yeah, the observatory. Okay. Yeah, let's start there. I mean, that's that one's exciting. And that's where we've been spending all of our time recently, you and I. But um, the idea was simple. It's there needs to be access to the universe for people. At this point, it should exist. It can exist and it should. And OPT being the global leader, we feel like this is this is our calling. This is what we need to do. We need to empower people to explore the universe. Right. And so the idea was, why don't we just create that access? Why don't we find a way to make this something that people can do with what they have, where we're not asking them to meet us out in the dark skies, but instead you have a cell phone, you have a laptop, you have these things. What if we made a network of observatories that were so simple to use that people could log in and control these things from wherever they were? All they would need is an Internet connection. And they could control these things and these would run all night long, giving them those live images in color in real time or at least, you know, whatever your exposure time is, 30, 40 seconds with the systems we're using and experience the universe around them instead of just waiting on the organizations out there to, to show them which parts of their neighborhood they should see. Instead, just explore. 
right? That's the idea. And so we settled on, after putting a big plan together, it took about a year, we settled on the idea of 62 observatories around the world. At this point, we've built six and a half, another one's on the way. And um, we've really been refining the process with your help, mm -hmm. um, making them extremely simple to use. I mean, you've been running these by yourself now for a long time and you know they're still not exactly where we want them but they work and mm -hmm. we've been able to do virtual star parties and show tens of thousands of people or more yeah these. and the the new setup like i was and again you know we're gonna start running these live here on the youtube channel like the moon is back right now but as soon as the moon gets lost yeah. um the tests that i was doing though i was bringing up images 10 second images of andromeda that looked really good and yeah. so i think i can probably do 30 plus 40 images an hour and show people different objects in the night sky like probably twice as fast as we were doing them last time it's amazing yeah yeah that's the benefit of this refinement process though is that when you say 10 seconds of andromeda that look really good we're talking about 10 second photos that look like what people are seeing on instagram right now yeah. that, that people are spending tons of time getting right. These are images that blow us away and we still see them all the time. So no, it's really, it's getting to the point where we think we can turn this over as a free resource to the public and to schools and to anyone that wants to use it and maybe achieve a couple of things. One, we can do exactly what our mission was, which is give people access to the universe. But the second one is maybe we can avoid a, f a few uh, flat earth conversations and things like that moving forward too, which would be a nice benefit as well. Yeah, right? I, I don't think that's possible, but you know. Yeah, maybe not. It's, it's a good aspiration. Um, yeah, doing my best. I, I got a question here that just came in, which I, which I like. This comes from Ray's Astrophotography. Um, what's your take on why astrophotographers prefer prefer to still take pictures and keep doing that, even though there are a bunch of pictures of the same object. Sure. I've never really understood um, the question. I get asked this question a lot and I've never really understood the question. I mean, when people travel, why do they take pictures of anything? I mean, why, why capture anything for yourself if someone else can capture it for you? I think there's an artistic process. I mean, how many times have people put paint to a canvas? But that doesn't mean that someone shouldn't pick up painting as, you know, their hobby or as their passion or whatever it is. I think you can do these things and make it your own. And if you look at two astro photos, they're never the same. Yeah. And people are finding new things. I mean, there's a there's also this entire citizen science component to this. People are finding supernovas every single day. You know, people are finding all kinds of, you know, the the modern scientist is whoever has the will to do it. It's not just people that have the education for it anymore. There are people out there making massive discoveries that never went to school for these things. And I think that uh, that's this whole other side of it that is starting to get talked about more and more. But there are a ton of reasons. I don't take photography to be the pioneer of photography. I take photography because it's my passion and it's something that, you know, feels unique to my identity something i enjoy doing right yeah it's not like you're you're ch contributing to some big checklist of all of the right. photographs and once someone's taken right. that picture then it's you don't need to take a picture of it like i think that each object and this is the thing that i've really learned is that each object is its own special creature that some of them have a really bright center like andromeda or orion and and you can't take a long exposure of that core while the outer, you know, the outer edges, the dust lanes, the nebulosity are a lot trickier to pull out. And so it requires technique and really artistry to be able to, to create a balanced image that you feel matches what that galaxy should could look like, you know, with the eye or, or whatever. And I think that, that that's a personal, it's a personal approach and it's tough. It's tricky. For sure. Yeah, well, I think that's the that's the wonderful thing about astrophotography, right, is it allows for this beautiful philosophical intersection where science and art meet and you can lean whichever way you, you want to, but you can you can really push the boundaries of either. And that's what astrophotography allows people to do. And I think that's why you get so many people so invested, you know, into this hobby. And the, I mean, the science side is, is part that I don't think should be neglected as much as the, as the art. I mean, the pictures that you take 
are beautiful, but you know, you're often the first to admit that they have no value to a scientist. If any, oh, no, you know, maybe to inspire them <laughs> to study that object. But yeah, it's not why I do yeah, it. Yeah, they can't pull you know? any science data out of it. But I think that no. that is one of your objectives is to create instruments which can be used for science by regular people as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a big part of what the observatory project is for. And it's the same equipment. You know, what we do is, so we have a, a division of OPT called professional services. We sell to like MIT and Google and NASA and all that stuff. That's all they do all day, every day. And so when we sell a lot of these big systems, I won't say which ones were where, but you sell to some of these top universities in the world. What we do is we just replicate the system. So instead of buying one to put in, you know, university on the East Coast, what we'll do is we'll buy two. And then we'll send them theirs, but we replicate the same system because we've already done the work. Yeah. We had to do all of the work of putting the system together, making sure all the components work, making sure that this is perfect for the job. And now that we know it, why not put one out in dark skies in the desert in the Mojave and let everyone log into it and use it? And that's what's happening. So these systems that are going out there, are a lot of them are state-of-the-art systems that allow people to take really push the boundaries of the artistic expression side of astrophotography or really push the boundaries of the scientific approach yeah and on the science side i mean as you said you can discover supernova you can uh, find asteroids you can discover comets you can confirm or discover exoplanets yeah. like there are a lot of 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 really interesting work like people think that the sky is very well mapped but it really isn't at any kind of detail and there's a ton of work that still can be done it's just that people don't know where to get started i mean there's the right. the uh, there's variable star astronomy there's um uh, you can discover uh, planets through uh, transits, so there's a there's a lot of really great uh, you know great projects out there. Gravitational microlensing planets as right. well. So I think that people can get involved. So one last thing is pretty cool is you guys are building a space telescope. We are, yeah. We partnered with is actually one of our uh, our former employees that came into my office one day and was just like, hey. Um, this is the hardest conversation I'm ever going to have because this is family, but I've got to leave. I've, I can't work here anymore because I built a, um, a telescope, a satellite space telescope, and I got to start this company. <laughs> we were just like, we're in, we're in, let's do it. So we, we partnered and uh, it's called Space Fab. But um, yeah, I mean, this thing is built. It's been approved. Like all of this stuff that started as this dream in his garage is now going to fly. I mean, and it's the same thing. It's giving the public access for the first time ever to a space telescope, right? And that's that's the whole thing. I mean, we have that, we, we're trying to put a telescope in every single high school in the country free of charge, you know? It's like, these are the projects that should exist. That one's called Future Stars. And, you know, it's it's uh, been under development for about six months and it's unbelievable how much support these things get. You know, you push it out there and you just say, is this an idea that is important to you? And what inevitably comes back every single time is just a flood of emails, a flood of people coming in saying, whatever you need, I'm in. We, are, we will make this happen. And so what we plan to take seven or eight years, instead it ends up happening in like two, you know, but it's, um, it's a really, really good thing. And this kind of stuff has a, a thousand spinoff projects, like the triad filter was developed out of one of those, which eliminated the light pollution problem for at least pretty pictures. And it's one thing after the next, but the team here does such a good job of thinking big and just saying, how do we tackle this problem, which is people don't know how amazing the universe around them is. They don't know how unifying it is for the human experience. They don't know that this stuff is accessible because it's all relatively new. We literally the only generations that have ever experienced it. And so how do we make this known? How do we connect people to it? And how do we make it something that even if you can't just dive into a hobby that's going to cost, you know, two or three hundred dollars or more, then you still have a way if you have an Internet connection to be involved. And I think that's, you know, that's the heart of all of these programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to get to people's questions. I mean, if you've got like yeah. really specific, very detailed questions about astrophotography, uh, you know, put them in the chat if you if you've got some ideas, because um, I would love to get, uh, you know, some answers from Dustin while well, we've got them here. Um, A.V. Scott and Flower asks, do you ever aspire to see Planet Nine with your telescope systems? 
Um, you know, so for my personal stuff, all I'm ever doing is pretty pictures. So I don't, <laughs> I don't get involved in any of it. Um, you know, I've got people here that love the science side and they love the arguments and they love all of that. But honestly, if you find me, I'm going to be spending 90 hours to get data that a scientist is going to be very upset that I destroy afterwards to make it super colorful and just to post it on Instagram and share it with people and get them excited about space. But that's the extent of what I'm doing with my personal systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, It'll be interesting. I mean, something like Planet Nine is probably at the limits of the big observatories here on Earth or the space telescopes. Yeah. So it's once it is discovered, uh, but I don't think that it will be visible to regular telescopes. Although, say Pluto is. I mean, you can you can image Pluto if you've got a powerful enough telescope and you know where to point it and you take a bunch of images. It's hard to figure out because the because it's such a faint object, you have to take a fairly long exposure and, you know, see it blinking right. <laughs> the way, the way yeah. they did back in the day. Right. Um, um, so Curtis Thompson asks, is going to the desert the only way to get nice telescopic views? Uh, visually, you really need dark skies and aperture is still king. So you want the biggest telescope you can possibly afford and carry around if you just want to use an eyepiece. But the second you put a camera in instead of an eyepiece, that goes out the window. You can use a small telescope because your eye refocuses 60 times a second. Your exposure anyway is 60 times a second, right? And it's set. You can't change. There's no manual mode, yeah. unfortunately, on the exposure in your eye. But when you have a camera there, instead of exposing for a 60th of a second, set the exposure to 60 seconds or five minutes and just gather, just collect light. And so then you can start to see faint details on whatever it is you want to see. And you can really see, I mean, we've taken images of things 200 million light years away you know, with yeah. small systems. That's always my heartbreak when people ask me, like they look at some of these objects like that you've taken pictures of and they say, oh, if I could, I wish I could get in a spacecraft and I could fly really close to the Orion Nebula and look out the window and, and see what it would look like. But the reality is it, would, it wouldn't look great, even if you were right. really up close. It's, it's so big. It's and yeah. and the, the light becomes so diffuse. It's, it's right. only the long exposures that you can actually get to see what you need to see uh, the closest that I think we came to when we did the um, uh, we did the all-stars party this summer and we were up at the we were up at the observatory compound um, and someone had like how big was that telescope it must have been like an 18 inch Dobsonian there was like um, a really big the ones yeah the ones we no, the ones we went to that was a 20 inch Dobsonian and a 17 inch plane wave yeah so the 20 there's a 20 inch Dobsonian and you could see the spiral arm features in in a galaxy and and right. things like that but it's it was perfectly dark skies with a telescope that you need a step ladder to climb up to to be able to look through <laughs> right. the eyepiece right yeah exactly. that is just not portable and so <laughs> instead of as you said right your your meat cameras are dumping the photons every mm -hmm. few seconds when you're totally dark adapted compared to when you are uh, you're just taking a longer exposure. Right. What do you think about this, these new all automated telescopes? There's the, the what, the Unistellar and the Stellina? Yeah, I think it's phenomenal. I think that, you know, there's, there's going to be some heat. I think a lot of people, it's, it's like any evolution in any industry, right? There were people when digital cameras came out, there, there were hardcore film people that hated digital cameras. I mean, it started a war between the two, right? But the, problem with evolution it just doesn't wait on people to care or it doesn't wait on people to accept it it's the technology's there so it's happening and these fully automated systems i think are absolutely incredible again for me it's not about making it for purists it's about making it accessible and i think that's something that these new systems do they make yeah. it where you know it's not for everyone but for the people that it is for it does a really good job it makes it to where you can set this thing down zero cables run it from your cell phone it's an app right so you log in you hit the button of what you want to see it moves to it it tells you yeah. about it and then starts kicking you live images to your cell phone that's an awesome experience yeah that's amazing can Without confirm having to have any knowledge i yeah i i got a chance to play with the stellina and it is literally that simple you take the thing you set it up it looks like a portal a, a turret from the video game portal um you set the thing up 
and then you turn it on and it unfolds like a transformer, figures out where it is on earth, figures out the sky that it's looking at, like it plate solves a couple of pictures. And then you say, show me a picture of, and I went after some, you know, I live in some light pollution here. I went after some, uh, I went after M51 and it was a perfectly serviceable photograph of M51 that I didn't have need any technical ability really to be able to pull it up. But it wasn't the best picture of M51, but it, but I, but it's like that, I, that argument, right? The camera, the best, the best camera is the one that you're carrying. The best camera is the one that you're going to use. And this is absolutely the astrophotography rig that you're going to use. And you can keep it in your car all the time. I mean, it's just a battery and there's only one button on the thing, which I love power. Yeah. On, That's it, off. you know. I, I love it. And we just got twenty of the units in here, and I saw I saw them sitting back there, and I was like, these things won't last, you know, a day because it's just so simple. And I think that more of that needs to happen. It needs to be simplified, and you know, they they've done a great job with it. I'm I was amazed by it. Honestly, yeah. the first time I used it, I was absolutely amazed by it. I mean, it all it really feels like every telescope should be that way. It after playing around with it, it feels really frustrating that you ever have to use a telescope that doesn't do that right because it's just it's enraging to try and polar align your telescope and and you know you're out there and like people <laughs> listen to how spoiled we are i know i know well you just i'm sure you've done this right where you're like hey everybody you know come check out this telescope and then you're like setting the telescope up and you're like you're looking down and you're like oh look, just a second and then you're like which way is north and what time is it where are we and then you right you view two stars and for whatever reason the alignment doesn't work and then your your friends are like this is stupid your hobby yeah. is dumb and right. then right but this thing <laughs> you just set it up and boom 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 yeah. here come the picture and everyone can can just yeah. go after what they want. So so yeah, it's uh, because there's 20 minutes of setup time. You know, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna look at things that most humans have never even had the opportunity to see in high resolution. And you know, it's gonna spin exactly the rate the Earth does in the opposite direction to track it for us, and then guide if the wind blows. All of this stuff, and we're like, we gotta set this up for 20 minutes seriously. <laughs> you know, we've yeah. gotten spoiled, man. We've gotten yeah, spoiled completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, got a question, uh, Ray's astrophotography wanted to know, um, more information on the triad filter. So, yeah. so how does it work? So, yeah, that's a project we started, um, about a year and four or five months ago. And the idea was somebody came into the office, or one of our, one of our staff came, we have these meetings where we just throw out crazy ideas. And he said, let's make a filter that eliminates light pollution with color cameras. And so everybody kind of laughed because you got the Bayer matrix, you've got all these issues where you're just like, you can't give up the data. You're not gonna be able to see anything. And he's like, well, let's just do it anyway. Let's figure out a way. And so we started working on this filter that basically takes narrow band filters. So you've got hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, H beta, you've got these things. And what we decided to do was let's make a four channel filter that is now the triad ultra, but it's all on the same filter. And so instead of having a monochrome camera, where you switch to hydrogen, shoot it, and then yep. you program that to a certain color. You just shoot it all at once on a color camera. We didn't know if it would work or not because we went to seven different manufacturers. Literally all of them said, because we wanted it to be very, very narrow as well. They said, yeah, we can do it, but they're going to be 18, 19 nanometers, which is what all of the competitor products are. They're the ones that we rejected, you know, because they were too wide and we didn't want a light pollution filter. We wanted a true narrow band filter. And so... We finally, the last one was like, well, we think we can do it, but it's going to take a lot of iterations and it's going to be such a thin coating. It's going to be very, very challenging. We don't know. So, and we're not fronting the cost. So we just, I mean, we, it was a tough call, but we went in on the development and for a long time, man, I'm telling you, like there was this attitude here. We were just like, did we just make a huge mistake? We were buying, these are expensive filters. You know, they could be, they start at 300 bucks and go up and some of them are over a thousand each. Right. For each color. No, no, for each filter. So the filter has all of the colors on one filter. Right. So it's just one filter you put in front of a color camera. Yeah. You take the photo and you see a narrow band image in color then. You don't have to do combining of different channels. It's just there in color. It's amazing. Yeah. But it worked. But for about six months, we were just making glass that would never be usable for anything at very expensive cost. And 
considering ourselves massive, massive failures on this project. And then they sent us one and they were like, we think we did it. <laughs> and we tested this thing and it was in the parking lot, literally shooting through a street lamp. And then the Horsehead Nebula and the Orion Nebula together on the same image came up with so much hydrogen in the image that most of the image was red. We had to back it back down because it had that much hydrogen in the signal. And we were just like, we, I can't believe this thing worked. And, and I think that whole thing of light pollution, like a lot of people say, well, I, I live in New York or I live in Los Angeles or I live in Beijing, right? And it's, right. there's so much light pollution and that is normally, like you walk outside and if you're in one of those big cities, you can only see a couple of stars and and right. and they're probably jupiter and venus um yeah. you know you can't see a lot of a lot of stars so what how do these light pollution filters help you get around this problem well it's very specific the band pass that it's allowing through so filters don't bring things in they reject things and so what we're doing is we're rejecting everything that isn't exactly the signal you want so like let's say you're going to shoot the horsehead nebula that's a popular one right we know that it's full of hydrogen right it's full of sulfur it's full of oxygen so what if we just shoot it in those wavelengths because we know the street lamp outside isn't putting off hydrogen alpha so we can shoot right through it and it's not putting off enough of anything in these band passes where basically we can shoot right through that and see what it is behind it and only that light will come through and so you know it um it's been done for a very long time with monochrome cameras it just hasn't been done on one filter because that's that's the challenge it's easy to make a hydrogen alpha filter it's hard to make a hydrogen alpha hydrogen beta sulfur two and oxygen three all on one filter passing those at three to four nanometers each that was the challenge is doing it all at once but it works and it cuts out all the sh the cars driving by you know the moon's glow those things and um you know, I can't tell you how many messages I get on Instagram. People are like, check this out. Full moon, still imaging. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it, it really is. It changed the game for people. It made light pollution uh, you know, relatively a non-issue for people to take their emission nebula data. And I mean, you guys did a, a pretty um, great demonstration of this. You set up a bunch of telescopes in the middle of Times Square, which is exactly like one of the most light polluted places in the world and took pictures. Right. Yeah, that, that was the way we, we were just like, if we're going to tell people you can shoot anywhere with this, let's go to the worst place ever. <laughs> yeah. You know, let's not tell people that unless we're willing to do it. And so there was a documentary crew with us at the time. They're shooting a documentary on um, OPT. And um, so we all went. They were like, well, we're going to go. Let's go to Times Square. Let's do this thing. And we got permission from the city the second time around. We did it twice. The first time the counterterrorism unit threw me out. Um, but... <laughs> You know, Oops. it happens. Yeah, whatever. And uh, it's a different story. Yeah. But um, the second time they gave us permission, we came out with the telescopes and set up and all we needed was one test shot. We just needed to prove that even there with all of these lights, I mean, you've got 25, 35 foot uh, LCDs like blaring down on you. If we could cut through that, we knew you could definitely shoot this in any backyard in the world. And, um, you know, it cut right through it, man. We were getting... Uh, nebula data coming in and so we were just like this works you know we still have the tree problem we still have the building <laughs> the, problem the clouds we still have the yeah. clouds but this light pollution problem we think we can get through that yeah that that'll be the next one if someone on your team comes to you with a cloud <laughs> filter you should definitely uh you know uh, yep. go with that yeah well, we have enough, uh, you know, most people here, their education was in physics or something like that, that, that are doing the design. So they haven't come up with the cloud filter yet, <laughs> right. but I'd love to hear that conversation in one of these meetings for sure. So what do you think about Starlink in terms of light I pollution? Think, I don't think it's a problem. I know everybody's up in arms about it, but the truth is, if you'd have told astronomers, you know, 50 years ago, that there were going to be as many satellites and debris that's up there now, they would have told you then you absolutely cannot do astronomy with all of those up there. You're not going to be able to do it, you know, and astronomy isn't phased by it. You can still do it. And the algorithms are so good. I get streaks through my image all the time, but you know, the algorithms are so good that that stuff is removed. And um, I honestly think that it's not going to destroy astronomy any more than the satellites that are up there now are destroying astronomy. Yeah. And I mean, the argument that I always make is just, What's the alternative, right? If right. another three and a half billion people want to get access to the internet, what's the alternative? It's millions and millions, 
of of cell towers. It's mm -hmm. digging tunnels through all kinds of environments. It's laying undersea cable through sensitive marine environments. It is yeah. filling the all the you know everything with electromagnetic radiation that's going to cause interference with radio telescopes and all kinds of things. So people yeah. getting access to the internet is inevitable. And now the question is just what's the way that that they want, you know, that you're fine with them doing it. And I think I would prefer the satellite route. But then again, you're going to be an astrophotographer, you're going to take your fancy telescope and your really high speed internet out into the middle of nowhere now, and mm -hmm. be able to share your pictures. So you right. know, there's a real advantage there. You solve one problem, and that's the thing, is you have a really smart person solve a problem, and then it creates a few other peripheral problems. <laughs> but the benefit of being involved in astronomy is everybody I talk to, and I guarantee you, everybody watching this right now, these are all hyper-intelligent people. People interested in this stuff. Are, I love talking to them for that reason. Everybody you talk to is so smart and has this passion for these things, right? And so you get all of these smart people thinking about a problem, it'll be solved. Yeah, and that's the question, right? Like, what... Like paint them black, um, figure out some way that they can uh, distort the light that's coming into them so that yeah. they're they're not causing a big reflection. Um, it does feel like a solvable problem. So right. Uh, and then the with the upside being high speed internet anywhere on Earth, which come on, right, we, we all deal. really want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of there. So if uh, if people were sort of reaching the end of our of our hour, so I just want to give a chance if people want to find out more about what you're working on, uh, where should they go? So we post everything to OPT, mostly through the social media channels. We find that that's where the most engagement happens. So OPT's uh, Facebook, uh, OPT Telescopes, which is the Facebook account, and then OPT Corp on Instagram. You see constant updates there on the things that are going on. Uh, for virtual star parties, we'll be posting that as well. But a lot of that's your time, Fraser. So, I mean, you'll be leading the charge with some of that. So yep. I know everybody here is obviously already following you. So that stuff will be updated. I post it to my personal Instagram as well, which is Gibson Picks, uh, P-I-C-S. And then, um, yeah, I mean, really the best place to find everything is optcorp.com. We update that, I mean, by the hour and all of these projects, news, um, there's a, as soon as you get there, there's a way to put your email in so that you get the updates and we kick that out to everybody every time we do something new. So yeah, constant well, updates. Well, you know, I just want to say a big thank you from uh, from me and from a lot of people in the astronomy community. Uh, you have been an absolute supporter of every wacky scheme that that I have thrown at you and that I know a lot of people have thrown at you. And it's an absolute pleasure to to work with you uh, in this field. I mean, it's just I, I hope people get the sense of how generous and how giving you've been in everything you've been working on. And um, man, we are really looking forward to to what happens next. I think you're going to make a big difference in just helping people get access to the night skies. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I very much appreciate that. And I can honestly tell you, man, I love the ideas. I think this stuff is extremely important. And um, you you won't find people in this building that don't feel the same way. And so I know everybody here talks about you like your OPT family, right, for these crazy ideas. So I think we're going to do a lot of these things together. And hopefully it gives people exactly that. If we can solve this problem and give people access to the yeah. universe, it will all be worth it. Yeah, we want to share the golden age of astronomy with everybody. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to the moderators. Um, thanks to, uh, man, to, to Dustin and uh, everyone at, at OPT for uh, giving us an hour of his time. And uh, the next time you see him, it'll probably be uh, hanging out with me and a telescope. So, uh, so stay tuned. Yeah. I'm sure uh, that'll be popping up uh, very soon. So thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all uh, next week. I think we've got Paul from James Webb Space Telescope. Paul Geithner, from, uh, who's been on the Weekly Space Hangout a couple of times. So we will be asking him all of your questions about the, the James Webb. And in fact, the next video that we're working on for the Guide to Space is all about the James Webb. So hopefully you will have a full explainer on James Webb, and then you will hammer him with your questions about it. Um, so, so stay tuned. That'll be a, a week from today. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all next week. Let me press the stop button.